Please be seated. is now in session. As scheduled, the chamber will continue its proceeding by hearing the testimony of a witness TCW253. Before we proceed with the hearing of the testimony, we would like to inform parties to the proceeding that for today's proceeding and the subsequent days, Judge Yotra will be absent due to his health reason. And after the consultation, with all the judges of the bench, we decide to appoint Judge Tru Muni to replace Judge Yutra, who is absent until the return of a Judge Yutra to his seat. The decision is by on Rules 29.4 of the Internal Rules of the ECCC. Mr. Dao Wan San, could you report the attendance of the parties and individuals to today's proceeding? Dao Wan San, Mr. President, for today's proceeding, all parties to the case are present. As for Nguyen Chi, he is present in the holding cell downstairs based on the decision of the trial chamber concerning his health. The witness, TCW253, already took an oath this morning, and he confirms to his best knowledge and ability he has no connection or relation through any of the accused, that is Nguyen Chi and Kiel Samporn, nor any of the civil parties recognized in this case. The witness has a duty counsel, Mom Ratir, and they are ready to be called by the chamber. We also have a reserve witness that is TCW548, but uh, this witness hasn't taken an oath yet. President, thank you, Mr. Ansan. Court officer, could you invite the witness TCW253 and his duty counsel into the courtroom?
President, good morning, Mr. Witness. Can you tell us your name? Witness, Mr. President, my name is Ian Pan. President, thank you. How old are you, Mr. Ian Pan? Response, I am 60 years old. Thank you. Question, where is your current residence? Response, I live at Bay Village on Longwell Commune, Batambong Province. Thank you. Question, what is your current occupation? Response, I'm a soldier. Thank you. Question, what is your father's name and uh, your wife's name, your mother's name, and how many children do you have? Response, my father is Ian Po and my mother is Uung Mut, they're both deceased. And my wife's name is Tung On and we have five children. Thank you, Mr. Yung Pan. As reported by the Greffier, through your best knowledge and ability, do you have no relation by blood or by law through any of the civil parties recognized in this case 002, nor through any of the two accused, that is, Nguyen Chi and Kiu Samporn. Is this information correct? Response, yes, it is. Thank you. Question, also as reported by the Grachi, you already threw an oath before you entered this courtroom this morning. Is this correct? Response, yes, it is. Thank you. We would like to inform you of your right and responsibility as a witness before this chamber. Mr. Ian Pan, as a witness before this chamber, you may refuse to respond to any question or request for your comment that would incriminate you. This is your right against self-incrimination if you think your response might incriminate you. And I believe you understand this right and for that reason uh, you already have a duty counsel with you. So if you think any of the question put to you may lead to a response that could incriminate you, you may seek consultation with your duty counsel before you decide either to respond or to refuse to respond to such a question. Also, as a witness before this chamber, it is your obligation to respond to all the questions put to you by any other parties or the bench, except in the case that your response or comment may in incriminate you. As I just stated earlier, and also as a witness, you must tell the truth that you have known, have heard, have remembered, or experienced, or through your direct observation of any event concerning the questions put to you by any other parties or the bench. Mr. Ying Pan. Had you been interviewed by any of the investigators of the Office of the Co-Investigating Judges during the last few years? If so, how many times and where did it take place? Response. I was interviewed once by the office of the co in fact uh, twice 
the uh, Madame Bong provincial town. The first interview was not in details. Question, can you recall when was the first interview taken place? Response, the first interview took place in 2009, and the second interview was in 2010. Thank you. Question, before you appear before this chamber to re-read your interviews that was indeed your interview with the Office of the Co-Investigating Judges in order to recollect your statement. Response. Yes, indeed, I reviewed the interviews. Thank you. And to your best knowledge and recollection, can you confirm whether the written record of your interviews that you have read in fact uh, are consistent uh, with your responses you gave to the investigator of the Office of the Co-Investigating Judges? Response. Yes, the written records of the interviews are consistent with my responses. Thank you. Mr. Ian Pan, you may put your document aside and listen to the questions put to you by the parties. And if uh, you are requested to refer to the document, then you may do so. Otherwise, it is not necessary for you to look at the document. Please try to respond to the questions based on your memory and recollection. And you may be requested to refer to your written records of interviews from time to time. And the prosecution, you are reminded that for the questioning of this witness, you will be given the floor first. And the time allocation for the prosecution and for the lead co-lawyers are for half a day. You may proceed. Mr. President, Your Honours, uh, may it please you. Good morning. Good morning to my fellow counsel, and good morning in particular to you, Mr. Ian Pan. Mr. Ian Pan, I have a series of questions to ask you relating to military matters. You ha have been a soldier for over 40 years and it's your experience and knowledge of these military matters that I anticipate will assist the tribunal. I will be referring to extracts from your previous OCIJ interview dated the 23rd of November 2009 E3 slash 419. Mr. Ingpan, can I start please just by setting your military history in some context? You stated in E3 419, answer one that you joined the army on the 28th of July 1970 when you were aged 18 and that in September 1970 you joined the military forces in District 105 in Takao.
My first question is this. How soon after you joined the district forces were you engaged in any military action with Lon Nol soldiers? Thank you for your question. Allow me to respond to this question. I indeed joined the army in 1970, and the reason for me joining the army uh, was the, after the coup d'état by Luna to topple uh, Sihanou. So the schools were closed at the time, and when some night CNO went to Beijing, he made an appeal to all Cambodian citizens to enter the Maki forest, and from that on, I joined the army. And when was your first military engagement with any Lon Nol troops? I engaged in fighting against the Lunar soldiers after the coup d'etat. And in fact, uh, I engaged in the battles on and off frequently since I was in the district militia and until I also joined the military forces. Thank you. You said also in this same extract, E3419 answer one, that in 1972 you became a platoon commander in Company 14 under Sien, and that was a special unit under the supervision of Sector 13. Can you help me, please, with any major military engagements that you remember in 1973 or 1974? Yes, I joined in, uh, countless, in countless battlefields in uh, Takai province, in uh, Kampota province, and also in uh, Presianu province, in Kampongspu province, as well as in Phnom Penh. Now, in 1973 and 1974, was the liberated area occupied by the liberation forces getting bigger or smaller? The liberated area became larger as the Lunar soldiers only remained along the main road and in the provincial towns. Now, during these many military engagements, did all villagers that you encountered support the liberation forces? In general, the movement between 1970 to 75 attracted huge support from the ordinary people. If any villagers were considered to have opposed the revolution, what happened to them? At that time, there was none to oppose the liberation forces. In fact, they actually joined the liberation forces. 
Can you help us, please, on what happened to Lon Nol soldiers if they were captured? After the arrest of the Lunar soldiers, we were at the front. We did not know what happened to them because they would be sent to the rear. Do you have any knowledge during this period of the civilian village populations of Ang Tasom and Kampong Trak? ever being evacuated. During that time, during the, the battle, in fact, the civilians would evacuate themselves in order to avoid the fighting. After you joined the military, were you ever aware of a relocation program where people were forcibly moved out of their villages by liberation forces? At the provincial towns where the liberation forces uh, reached, the people themselves moved to the rear. And I did not know whether they would return to their provincial towns because at that time I was uh, at a lower rank of the chain of command. Do you know what happened to these villages? At that time, it was uh, unclear to me. In this period from 1970 to 1975, how did military units communicate with one another? As for the liberation forces, uh, we communicated uh, by radios. When were telegrams first used? <laughs> when I joined the the army, in fact, each unit would have a telegram for the communication with the various other units or through the headquarters. Can I just be clear, was this telegram procedure in place directly after you joined the army in 1970 or did it come a few years later? The telegrams were used since I joined the army that for the communication between the front command and the rear command. Mr. Ng Pan, I want you to help us next with some military terms. Other witnesses have spoken about them, but perhaps not accurately. Now, in terms of the lower collections of soldiers, can I start with a platoon? Is it right that a number of soldiers would make up a platoon? Uh, 
The platoon would compose of 30 soldiers, which were from we were made out of three squads. So what you've said there is we've actually introduced squad beneath platoon. How many platoons in a company, please? Three platoons would make a company. That is, it equals to nine squads. How many companies make up a battalion? Four companies would make up a battalion. I'm going to give the structures above this and then I want you to explain them, please, to the court. Regiment, brigade, division, general staff. Now, was there regiments above the battalion level? As I stated, three companies would make a battalion and four battalions would make up a regiment. Now, if we look at the strata above this now, I should say I was only in the Army for four years and you've been in the Army for 43 years. But brigades and divisions, can you explain that to the court, please? The difference between the regiment and the division is that four battalions would make up a regiment. And then do we have so many regiments in a brigade or in a division? For the regiment, four regiments would make up a brigade. And then is it a case of so many brigades making up a division? Or have I got that wrong? For the military structure at the time, there were indeed uh, divisions, and each division was comprised of five brigades. One was an intervention uh, brigade, and the other four would be the infantry. Right, thank you. I hope that's going to help everyone's understanding now of other military terms that we use. Now, you said in E3419 answer 1 that in December 1974, you became chairman of Battalion 204, which was part of Brigade 2 in the southwest zone.
Where were you located in December 1974 when you became chairman of a battalion? In 1974, I became the commander of Battalion 203 in the southwest zone under the subordinate of Brigade Number 2. You've used the phrase, um, you've used the phrase commander, and I just want to look at some important positions within a battalion the names given to the important positions. Now, is it right that every battalion would have a commander and a deputy commander? Or have I got that wrong? The battalion that I control was called a Special Battalion 203, and there was a commander and three deputy commanders. Can you help us as to whether there was a secretary and a deputy secretary or not? No, at that time there was no secretary. There was a radio operator. Now, at this time in December 1974, is it right that your brigade commander was Sam Bit? No, it was not the regiment. In fact, some better was in charge of uh, Brigade Number 2 in the Southwest Zone. I'd like to move on to the subject of meetings to disseminate military orders. Now, in E3419 answer 3, you said that Tamok, the southwest zone commander, called the brigade and division commanders to meetings with him. Can you just give us some idea on how often he would do this? As for the words about uh, my knowledge, I would not uh, know much about that. I only had the right to participate in the meetings with the regiment. However, as for the brigades or the divisions, they would be entitled to have the meetings at the zone level. Let's talk about some meetings at, at your level as a commander of a battalion. In your previous interview, still on answer three, you said that after the high-level meetings, that the brigade and divisional commanders would then disseminate information downwards to the regimental and battalion levels. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct as I stated in my written record of interview. So you as the commander of a battalion at this stage, how often would you go to meetings 
to receive the information from the higher levels. The meetings at that time were the meetings held in the battlefield, and there were two scenarios. One was based on the real situation, and it was held on a monthly basis. And in case of a special need in the battlefield, as I was the commander of a battalion, I was at the disposal of the regimental commander. So if I was called by the regimental commander at any time to attend a meeting, then I would go to it. Let's say you went to a meeting with the regimental commander. He gave some orders to you as the battalion commander. How would you then disseminate those orders to the soldiers under your authority? In the ordinary practice, once I receive the commands from the regiment level, I would convene the meetings amongst the companies under my control. And as I stated, it could be a regular monthly meeting or it could be based on the real need of the situation. Thank you. I want to move next to the military orders for the attack on Phnom Penh. Now, you said at E3419 answer 3, and I quote, I attended meetings with Sam Bit when he said that the entire Southwest Zone Army was to just attack the Pochantong Airport and then evacuate the civilian population from the city with the goal of assessing to see who were the Lon Nol soldiers. End quote. Now, how many meetings did you attend to receive the orders for this attack? When we received an order from the upper level, in particular for the attack on Phnom Penh, I only knew about the plan for my spearhead. And for the, uh, that is for my battalion. And in fact, the spearheads that I was to attack was around this area, there is a contour area, and then leading through the Pujantong Airport. And of course, I was not aware of the instructions from for other directions of spearheads. I only knew what was assigned to me. Now, how long before the liberation of Phnom Penh, which was on the 17th of April 1975, how long before that? in days or weeks did you receive your orders for the attack? In fact, we received the orders one month uh, before it happened because uh, once we received the order, then we need to conduct a proper sort of research and we needed the time in order to monitor the situation and then to make the report before the attack commenced. Where were you when you received these orders one month beforehand? 
In other words, what village were you near or what part of the country were you based? In fact, I was in the uh, special battalion unit. It means that uh, we made a sudden attack and a sudden withdrawal. And for that reason, in fact, uh, we based ourselves at the rear. And for the attack of Kontok uh, and Pochintong, we were about 10 kilometers at the rear because we only made a sudden attack and then we made a sudden withdrawal and then the infantry would uh, take charge of the battlefield after we withdrew ourselves. I just want to go back to the orders one month before the attack. Can you remember where you were when you received those orders? Or how far away from Phnom Penh you were when you received those orders? This location, and when you talk about the battlefield, that was uh, my direction uh, leading from Kontok to Puchintong. And at that time, I was about three kilometers away uh, from this area. Was it explained to you in the special battalion unit why it was important to assess who were the Long Nol soldiers. To me, it is not uh, that difficult because during the war time, the Long Nol soldiers wore different uh, military uniforms, that is the para uniforms, and for us, we dress in the black uniforms. And as for the geographical uh, area, it is distinct. Luno soldiers stayed on one location, and we stayed on the opposite direction or location. You said that you received the orders one month beforehand. You then had to make preparations. Now, were any instructions or orders given as to what you should do with captured Long Nol soldiers during the attack on the airport? During the battlefield, there was a universal principle of the prisoner of war. The upper echelon always instructed us not to kill the prisoners of war. So after we liberated the area, and if any prisoners of war were arrested, then I would send them to the rear. And of course, it is up to the rear to do whatever they do with those people. You said that your orders were to evacuate the civilian population from the city. Now, were any reasons given to you for the need to evacuate the civilian population from Phnom Penh. As for the issue of evacuation, I'd like to state that 
Of course, uh, for any battlefield, the civilians would flee from the battlefield area. And at my battalion level, I would not know about the policy of the upper echelon at the rear. But uh, from what I could say, during the, the battle, people would flee from the battlefield and then they would run uh, through the rear. And I would not know the policy of the upper echelon at the rear to do with the evacuated people from the battlefield. What my question was aimed at was, were you given any party line or military instruction on why the people had to be evacuated out of Phnom Penh? As I just stated, for the evacuation of people at my level, I was not informed because I never received instructions from the upper echelon of regarding this matter. What I only observed was that for any battlefield area, the people or the civilians would evacuate themselves to the rear. Now, on the days leading up to the liberation, did you just fight your way towards Ponchantong Airport, or did you come into Phnom Penh city itself? For my spearhead, we did not enter Phnom Penh. We remained at the Pugintong Airport upon our attack. Because when we reached and took control of the airport, then the in what infantry would arrive and then they would base themselves at the airport and we withdrew ourselves to the, uh, back to the rear. So if we take a few months after the liberation, so let's say May, June, July of 1975. Where were you based during this period? About two months after the liberation of Phnom Penh, my battalion forces were required by the upper echelons to, to go through the Khmer Vietnamese border at the Mongkul Bore district in the current Takao province. Now, who was the military commander of your zone at, at this stage? The divisional commander at the time was Sam but And who, if anyone, was above some bit in the military hierarchy? The commander above some bird was the zone commander, and that was Tamok. He took charge of the entire southwest zone. Now, you've mentioned some bit being one of the commanders. You also mentioned in E3419 answer 4 that Mias Mut was also a commander of, I don't know, it Brigade or Division 3. Can you clarify that?
In the southwest zone, there were two brigades, brigade number two led by some bird, and brigade number three led by Mir Mut. And where was Mir Mut's brigade located? Brigade number three of uh, Mihmut uh, during the war time was based along National Road, was based on both sides of uh, National Road number four, so they could in fact uh, direct uh, their way either to Kampung Saum or to Phnom Penh. How long had Mayat Mut commanded Brigade 3? As I recall, he was in charge of the brigade for only a few years, about two to three years. And uh, upon the time that Phnom Penh was almost liberated, in fact, he left uh, the brigade and Sein came to replace him for brigade number three. Now, Mr. Ying Palm, we have a document on our case file. I'm not going to show it to you. I, I just want to refer to it. It's the... August 1975 issue of the revolutionary flag. It's E3 slash 5. But this document reports that on the 22nd of July 1975 there was a ceremony of the Communist Party of Kampuchea Center to establish the Revolutionary Army of Kampuchea. Now, do you have any knowledge of this ceremony for the formation of the Republican Army of Kampuchea? No, I do not know about the creation of that army because I only knew that the army existed since 1970 until 1975 because uh, through my knowledge I only knew about the uh, true brigades that is uh, brigades number two and number three in the southwest zone. I'm going next to be reading some extracts from your OCIJ statement that I referred to. Can I hand a copy to you just so that you can follow the questions? And uh, I'm, can Mr. President, this document please be provided to Mr. Ian Khan. President, yes, you may do so. Court officer, could you deliver the document from the prosecution for the business uh, examination? Mr. Ing Pan, my first question is going to relate to answer number 14. Answer number 14 in this document. And this is about screening and removal. You were asked this question. What do you know about screening and sweeping clean within the Khmer Rouge army framework? And your answer was, and I quote, during the Khmer Rouge era, in general, there was screening within the army framework. That is, if they discovered someone, sorry, I'll start again. 
That is, if they discovered that someone had inclinations toward former high-ranking Lonnol soldiers, that person would be removed from their position or sent to another location, like an agricultural work site. They were not allowed to work again inside the Khmer Rouge military framework. I never saw any killings of people discovered to have those inclinations." End quote. Now, in this um, screening process, did you ever have to provide a biography or personal history? In the common practice in the Khmer Rouge military army, in particular around 1976 and 77, there was a process of a screening, as I stated in my interview. Those people who had their relatives who were high-ranking or former high-ranking officers, they would be removed and sent to the rear to raise uh, chickens, to raise pigs, or, or to break rocks, or to plant uh, cotton, etc. And that was the fact. However, amongst the, the army, there were only a few cases. Uh, for instance, in my units, there were only two or three uh, cases, and if I recall correctly, nothing happens to them. And that's what happened. And I do not know about other events or incidents happens elsewhere. I could only attest to what happened under my unit. What were the, um, the ranks of the people that you know who were removed? As I just stated, I only knew about the unit under my supervision, and I did not know what happened in the other units. At that time, the liberation forces never used the word uh, ranking. We only refer to the military framework, for example, a company, a battalion, or a regiment. And under my uh, battalion, there were those uh, companies, and there was a very few combatants who were removed. The question was driving at what what level were these people who were removed? Were they commanders? Were they at platoon level, company level? Uh, we can say, I can say that uh, for those people who were found, they were plained uh, combatants, uh, they were also within the uh, platoon levels or the company levels, but I uh, would like to confirm against there were only very few cases. I'd like to read next an extract to you from a document number E3-798. This is a document from the 30th of August 1976 and it is the meeting at the minutes of the meeting of secretaries and deputy secretaries of divisions and independent regiments. And the extract I want to read is on English ERN 00183 
0.0968. Khmer 0005 2382. And French 0036 199. And I quote. Brother 89 gave an additional summing up. From the discussion, it is apparent that the enemy has commenced activities. And these activities are endowed with a leadership network because the news is the same and the slogans are the same. The enemy would like to take the opportunity to gather up no good elements. The status and rank conscious, those whose families we have swept out, those whom we have removed from their positions and those who have not internalized the revolutionary movement and can't keep up with the rest. And at the same time, the new people who don't yet understand things whom we are putting in difficulty and temporarily lack food. The CIA enemy is finding opportunities to gather them up to attack us." End quote. Now, Mr. Ng Pan, in your time in the military from 1975 onwards, did any military people talk about no good elements or not? In general, in the military forces, of course, uh, people would talk from one to another about the screening, about the removal of this person or that person. However, there was no official instruction for the commanders to proceed uh, with this uh, uh, policy or something. Like us, uh, like myself, I was not uh, instructed to do so. And for instance, even in my unit, if people were to remove, I was not informed. There would be instructions from the upper echelon, and those people would have uh, removed. Do you know um, who came to remove the people from your battalion and where they were from? They either came from the divisional level or from the zone level, and when they arrived, they would say they would like to invite this person or that person as they were required by the upper level. And of course, I did not have anything to say in that, and everybody was scared. I myself was scared in particular during the period from 1976 to 1978. Regardless of your position as an ordinary combatant or a commander, everybody was scared. And that the real situation at the time. I appreciate you, in, you were in the military, but did you know anything about the removal of new people who don't yet understand things. Um, 
As a soldier, I was really unclear on this issue. For things related to screening, or you can say related to the political affairs, we, the military, we would not know much about that. Of course, we were fully familiar with the military training, with the defense of our uh, territory. So we did not know what happened much at the rear as we placed ourselves for the protection of the country and the border. On the topic of screening and removal, was the CIA ever mentioned? Or did you ever hear mention of the CIA? During the war time, of course, I heard all the word the screening and the CIA. Even during the battlefield and after the battlefield, the word was still heard. You said in E3419 answer one that in uh, October 1976 you became the chairman of Regiment 12. Now, was that a promotion for you? The promotion was in fact for me as I had been the special battalion commander for quite a long time. So for that reason, I was promoted and I left the special battalion to become the commander of Regiment 12 under the supervision of Brigade Number no. 2. Now, you've mentioned before this that the southwest zone had two brigades, but you stated in this answer that the southwest zone military structure changed from two brigades to four brigades. Now, can you help us on why that enlargement of the brigades took place? I can say that after the liberation, and it was around 1976 or 1977, through additional brigades, were installed and brigades number two to number three were changed to 210 and 230 respectively and then there were additional brigades through 50 and through 70. So after the war ended and in late 76 or early 77, there were four brigades in the southwest zone situated, situated along the Vietnamese-Cambodian border. Thank you. I want to move on to military communication at this stage. You've already given an answer about communication, but I want to read you, please, some extracts from that document. E3419. The first was answer 7, where when referring to 1977, you said, and I quote, I was commander of inter in Intervention Brigade 221 in direct combat with the Vietnamese troops. 
Now, is this another promotion? Because you had been talking about you being promoted from battalion to regiment. In this extract, you're talking about an intervention brigade. Is that a promotion, or have I got that wrong? I just stated that I was in Regiment 12 under the supervision of Brigade Number 2. However, in early 1978, I was sent by the upper echelon to Swai Riang province. So my regiment also went to Swai Riang. So that is for Brigade Number 2, there was a shortage of my Regiment 12 as we moved to Swai Riang. And in Swai Riang, I was also assigned to be in charge of other three regiments. So in terms of the military structure, I was in charge or became promoted to become the commander of the Intervention Brigade number 221 at the time. Thank you, Mr. Ng Pan. That's a, a, a clear answer. Now, at question 11, in E3419, you were uh, asked this question, and I quote, in your position as a brigade commander, how did you communicate with upper echelon about the work? Answer, my military communications were by telegrams which were transmitted by a 15-watt machine in secret code numbers and then were decoded into letters of the alphabet. The machine could be used with communications radios as well. I routinely used telegrams like this and always sent them to Ren. My telegrams did not pass through any other leadership level, but I do not know who Wren sent telegrams to or what levels they passed through. I received telegrams many times directly from Son Sen. They were about military plans but those telegrams never passed through any leadership level. After I received the telegrams, I called my subordinates to set out plans to follow the orders of Wren." End quote. In terms of the telegrams that you received many times directly from Son Sen, were those telegrams only to you or were they copied to other people? As for the secrecy of the military, and if Ryan or Sonsen sent a telegram through me as the commander of brigade, of course there would be a direct communication from them through me. And I would not send any telegram to my subordinates. My approach was not to give them any written document because that is for the purpose of the secrecy. And I would convene a meeting for my subordinates and whatever they could, uh, they could get during the, the meetings, then that, that's it. If you were receiving a telegram from Son Sen, 
Would it be apparent from the telegram that it had been copied to other people, or was it just a telegram to you? Yes, I just stated uh, when I received a telegram, I would, no, I could not make a copy of the telegram for other people, but it is under my authority to convene the commanders and uh, my subordinates for a meeting. Of course, in the battlefield, when I had a document with me, I could uh, convene the meetings, and those people at the battlefields, they would not allow to have any written document with them for the sake of the secrecy. So, so how important were telegrams in conveying military orders? The importance of the telegrams was of the nature of the military instructions. In between 1976 to 1978, there were issues at the border with, the, with Vietnam. So the instructions from Ryan and from Son Sen in the telegrams were about the protection of the territory integrity at the border. And about the attack and counter attack. I'm moving to 1977, but only very briefly. You said in E3419 answer 5 that you were called by Ren to attend a meeting at Tamok's house in Takao City. And that meeting was attended by all brigade and division commanders. Um, what was the purpose of this meeting at Tamok's house? In late 1977, there was a meeting in which I participated and it was held in Takai province. It was required for certain military units to send their forces to the east, that is to Swairiung province. That was the main theme of the meeting at the time. You said also in the answer five that Ren frequently went up to meetings in Phnom Penh with Pol Pot and Son Sen. He wrote telling me. So just, just roughly how many occasions did um, Ren write to you? As for each meeting, and as I stated in my document, while I was in a Swai Ring, there was the formation of a division, and Ryan was in charge of the division comprising of five brigades, and my brigade was the Intervention Brigade number 221, and we were a mobile force. And there were other brigades, including 840 and 807. And Ryan was the commander of the division, and of course he had the authority to join the meeting with the upper echelons. And I was not uh, allowed to do so. But after the meeting, then he would disseminate the information to the five brigades in a meeting where the brigade commanders and the deputy brigade commanders would attend such a meeting. 
And circa 1977 and 78, there were already attacks uh, back and forth with the Vietnamese forces. For that reason, secrecy, secrecy was at the utmost importance. And of course, we would not be allowed to leak any information, and telegrams were in fact uh, encoded. And the instructions were all around this very topic. Because as the, for the military, the military did not focus about anything at the rear. We only focus on about the protection and the defense of our territory integrity and the attacks and counterattacks. And of course, the approach of doing that would be uh, sometimes to draw a sketch on the board for the attacks. And I, I am sure that as you stated earlier, you were also in the military for uh, some time, and secrecy for the military was an utmost importance. Thank you, Mr. Inkhan. I'd like just to read a couple more extracts about meetings. We're getting towards the end of, uh, of my questioning. Um, E3419, answer 12. You were asked this question. While you were based in Svelieng, did Wren ever hold meetings to tell you about any plans for treason by people in the East Zone? And your answer. Uh, Wren made announcements during meetings about treason by East Zone cadres saying that this person had been arrested or that person was sent to upper echelon and others had fled to Vietnam. I knew that Wren frequently went up to meetings in Phnom Penh since he wrote documents telling me that he was going up to Phnom Penh for meetings and requesting that those at the base area master the battlefield with vigilance. <clears throat> Going to Phnom Penh for meetings certainly meant meetings with Pol Pot and Son Sen, the most senior persons in regard to military planning were Pol Pot and Son Sen. Just an approximation, can you help us on how many times Wren went to these meetings in Phnom Penh? Just roughly. In late 1977 or early 1978, the attacks already took place uh, with uh, Vietnam. So Ryan, the division commanders, went for meetings in Phnom Penh frequently. I could not count the, the times or the number of times. However, sometimes he would uh, go on a weekly basis, depending on the urgency of the situations. But, of course, it took place uh, more frequent. The longest was uh, 10 days. And upon their arrival back at the base, the commanders would disseminate those military instructions to the subordinates. They talk about the defense, about the attack and the counter-attack, as I stated earlier. And of course, that were the instructions I received in my capacity as the brigade commander regarding the deployment of troops and the attack and the counter-attacks. President, thank you, Mr. Witness and the prosecution. The time is appropriate for a, a short break. We will take 20 minutes break and return at 10 to 11. 
court officer, could you assist the witness during the break and have him return to the courtroom at 10 to 11? The court is now in recess.